I'd like to give everyone a very warm welcome uh, and to those online too. Thank you for joining with us today. I want to read first words from the Scripture. It's Paul's words to Timothy when he says, First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. On Thursday, it was indeed very sad news for our nation when we heard of the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II as she passed into the presence of her Savior. I would like if we could stand for a minute's silence at at the beginning of the service, and could we stand, please, and we'll silence for a minute and then remain standing. I'll now ask a short video clip of a speech when she was 21 to be played. Celebrated her coming of age in South Africa with the most important speech of her 21 years. On my 21st birthday, I welcome the opportunity to speak to all the peoples of the British Commonwealth and Empire, wherever they live, whatever race they come from, and whatever language they speak. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. But I shall not have strength to carry out this resolution alone unless you join in it with me, as I now invite you to do. I know that your support will be unfailingly given. God help me to make good my vow, and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. Indeed, a remarkable life of service to our nation. I want to read words now from Isaiah 6. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. King Isaiah had reigned for 52 years. And this was a big moment in Isaiah's life. There was turmoil from such stability now the king, was di- king had died. And Queen Elizabeth II has brought great stability to our nation. But what is Isaiah saw is what we need to see this morning. As the hymn says that we'll sing at the end, though nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still one king reigning over all. And that's what Isaiah saw. He saw not an empty, the throne of Uzziah was empty, but he looked up and he saw there is one throne that will never be empty, and the Lord is sitting upon the throne. We'll bow our heads in prayer to God. Our God, we come to you in prayer this morning. We come before you, the almighty, eternal, unchanging God. We come before you, O sovereign God, We address you as our God and Father, and you alone, you alone are worthy to be worshipped. 
you alone are worthy of our heart's adoration this morning. And we bow before you, O King of the nations. We give you thanks for your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that we are reminded in Romans that we have been reconciled to you, O God, through the death of your Son. We are no longer alienated. We're no longer at enmity with you. We're no longer at a distance from you. We are now brought into your family, saved by grace, and to address you as our God and Father. We come to you this morning at a very sad time for our nation, and we come to give you thanks, our God, for your faithfulness upon the life of our Queen. We thank you for your faithfulness over her long life and how she served our God was behind it all was your faithfulness. And we give you thanks this morning for such a life, such devotion and service to her peoples that she reigned over. We give you thanks, our God, for her Christian faith that she was unashamed of. And we thank you for the many quotes and some one that was up just now on the screen that she knew Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. She spoke of the Lord Jesus as Savior. And we give you thanks for this today, our God, for the life of Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II. We do pray for King Charles. We commit him to you, our God. He needs our prayers. And we pray, our God, that he will be a defender of the faith. We think of how today we live and a, a day and age where many speak of our faith. But we thank you, our God, that there is one faith. There is one God. There is one Savior. There is one book of divine inspiration, and it is your word. And we pray that King Charles will be an upholder of each of these things. We do pray for the whole family and the grandchildren, great-grandchildren at this time of mourning. Comfort them, we pray. And yet we thank you for that words that we've read in Isaiah, that we can look up to you, our God, and thank you that you are the unchanging God. Your throne is never empty. You reign. We thank you that the Lord Jesus died and lives and is seated on his throne. And we thank you, our God, in a changing world for the unchangeableness of your throne. Today is the anniversary of September the 11th. And we think of how we, these things happen and they pass on and we think of wars, we think of what a, what a changing scene we live in. And yet we thank you, our God, for who you are. And we thank you that you are reigning and you are in control. Our God, today we pray that you will awaken each one of us as we're reminded of death, that there is eternity as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after death the judgment. Help us, too, to live our lives, to serve you, our God, to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. Receive of our worship and our praise this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
God's story, Jesus. So part of God's story, actually the biggest part of God's story, is about how he sent us a rescuer. And it goes like this. Way back in the beginning, God created a perfect world and he made it exactly the way he wanted. It was full of good things like oceans and mountains and giraffes and jellyfish. There was no sickness or sadness or death. And he made people, Adam and Eve, to live in his perfect world with him forever. People were God's favorite creation. In fact, he called everything he made good, but he called people very good. Then something awful happened. They disobeyed God. And then that's when all the wrong things in the world began. Now, even though people disobeyed God, he loves us more than anything. So God planned a rescue. One day, he would send his son to rescue his family from all the wrong things in the world. That way, we could be close to God again. God's family was so excited about this rescuer. They waited hundreds and hundreds of years. They thought the rescuer would be a mighty king or maybe a powerful warrior. Imagine their surprise when the rescuer was born as a little baby. It was Jesus. It wasn't what they had expected, but it was exactly what God had planned. Jesus was completely human, but also completely God. That means he was perfect and never did anything wrong. He ate and slept and had friends just like you and me, but he could also do incredible things that only God can do. And when he was all grown up, he was ready to show the whole world that he was God's son. When Jesus was an adult, he started traveling and doing miracles. A miracle is something amazing that can only happen with God's help. And Jesus did lots of miracles. He went to a party and turned water into wine. He fed 5,000 hungry people with just five loaves of bread and two fish. He calmed a raging storm by telling it to stop. He walked on water. He healed people everywhere he went. He made blind people see and paralyzed people walk. He touched the sick and made their diseases disappear. He even brought a dead man back to life. And he told people that he could do all of this because he was the son of God. Jesus didn't just heal people on the outside. He healed them on the inside too. He forgave their sins. That means they didn't have to be punished for their wrong choices. Instead, they could follow Jesus. Some people didn't like what Jesus was doing. They didn't believe he was the son of God. And even after all the miracles Jesus did, like healing the sick and making blind people see, they still didn't believe him. They actually yeah, wanted Jesus was... to die. And that's exactly yeah. what happened. Jesus had to suffer and die on a cross, even though he had never done anything wrong. When Jesus died on the cross, God's family was broken hearted. The rescuer was gone. They wondered how they would ever be close to God again. But then, something incredible happened. Jesus didn't stay dead. He came back to life. He was alive. He is alive. This was God's plan all along. Jesus chose to take the punishment for our sins. He died on the cross so we don't have to. And now anyone can become a part of God's family if we choose to believe that Jesus rescued us. We get to be close to Jesus because he loves us. He loves us when other people don't. He loves us when we feel left out, alone, and hurt. He loves us even when we do wrong things. And this isn't just your ordinary, everyday kind of love. It's the strongest, most powerful, never ending, never changing, always and forever kind of love. And no matter what we do or where we go, he will always be with us. And that's the story of Jesus. So in case you missed it, here's the quick version. God made a perfect world. People messed it up. God had a plan to rescue us. It was Jesus. He did miracles and healed people. He showed everyone that he's the son of God. He died for us, rose from the dead, and forgave our sins. He loves us and nothing will ever change that. And that's a really great part of God's story. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb of 
While hymn's eternal anthem drowns all music but its own Awake my soul and sing of him who died to be your savior and your Spending two days there, Jesus left and went to Galilee, for he himself had said, A prophet is not respected in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the people there welcomed him, because they had gone to the Passover festival in Jerusalem and had seen everything that he had done during the festival. Then Jesus went back to Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. A government official was there whose son was ill in Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to go to Capernaum and heal his son, who was about to die. Jesus said to him, none of you will ever believe unless you see miracles and wonders. Sir, replied the official, come with me before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed Jesus' words and went. On his way home, his service met him with the news, Your boy is going to live. He asked them what time it was when his son got better, and they answered, 
It was one o'clock yesterday afternoon when the fever left him. Then the father remembered it was at that very hour that Jesus had told him, your son will live. So he and all his family believed. This was the second miracle that Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. I think John, when he was writing the book of the writing John's gospel, I think he was wanting us to see Jesus and be excited about the Lord Jesus Christ. I said that when John wrote, he says, we have seen his glory, chapter one. And they found in the person of the Lord Jesus, they found Jesus irresistible. They found the Lord Jesus captivated them and they in their lives. What their life said was this, he is worthy. He is worthy of everything. And that story I finished with two weeks ago of Monica in northern Nigeria, whose life was miraculously uh, preserved, although she was thrown into the ditch. She's now a tacket, forgotten the name of the thing, Richard, my doctor, sitting there in her throat, and she could only barely speak. And yet when she was asked, she said her focus was an eternity. Our focus was now in Jesus. And in our lives that are so at times busy, I love what you said, Hazel, in your closing prayer two weeks ago. A rush always into the next thing, but at times we've just a pause. Slow down, ask ourselves questions. Just take a moment pause. What is the focus of our life? What is the number one in our life? And when we did John's gospel, chapter 2, the miracle of the, the water into the wine, we saw a demonstration of how the Lord Jesus changed that wedding from a crisis. He changed it. He brought joy into it. And what Mary, the last recorded words of Mary in the Bible, said is, whatsoever he says to you, do it, is actually great instruction for us all as to obedience. Last week, before Keith preached, I was having a time of prayer at the back with Kenneth and Graham and Alan Strachan. And I smiled at something Alan said in his prayer, and I asked him permission if I could say it today, and he said yes. But I thought it was really lovely what he said. He said, may we leave church bouncing this Sunday. And that resonated with me, and I thought, that's good. May we leave church bouncing. Thank you for that, Alan. I'll he'll quote you many times now. Uh, quote of Alan, bouncing. Because remember when we were young with a bouncy ball and you bounced it and it bounced and seemed to bounce forever until eventually the bounce got lower and lower until it stopped bouncing. And it needed that power again to make it bounce. I wonder today if we are Christians that are bouncing. Or have we lost the bounce and we're simply just existing? Because bouncing Christians will be impacting influential Christians. I pray today two things. I pray that God will open our eyes, open our eyes, Lord, that we may see Jesus. And secondly, if you've stopped bouncing, that the Spirit of God will work in you today and bring back the bounce that may be you once had for the Lord Jesus Christ. Where Janus read, after the two days he departed for Galilee, that two days were the two days the Lord Jesus spent in Samaria. I would love to have been there during that two days. I would love to have heard the woman of Samaria come back and say, come see a man who has told me all things I had ever done as she shared her testimony about Jesus. And that two days that the Lord spent in Samaria, that revival that took place, and the people said, we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior 
of the world. What it must have meant to the Lord Jesus to have heard the people turn from their unbelief and now acknowledge that he indeed was the Savior of the world. Says he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. Now, this may come across that they were welcomed him as the Savior of the world, but this word welcomed is a different word to John 1, where it says, as many as received him, that to them gave he the right to be called the children of God. That receive is a, an acknowledging of who the Lord Jesus is and receiving him as Savior. This welcomed here is simply they welcomed him as just someone who had done miracles. That's what it says, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast. For they too had gone to the feast. He came to Galilee from Samaria. In Samaria, there was great belief. But in Galilee, there was great unbelief. And where we have in verse 46, so he came again to Cana in Galilee. Cana in Galilee is where Nathaniel is from. It's where the first miracle took place. But it does say in Cana of Galilee that the disciples believed in him. It doesn't say anyone else believed in him. It says the disciples believed on him. There was unbelief. The Lord Jesus encountered great unbelief. And while he was there in Cana of Galilee, it now transfers our thoughts to Capernaum, because at Capernaum there was an official or a government official, a man of high uh, station, a, a, a royal official, different translations have different uh, ways in putting it. I think he was a royal official whose son was ill. In the first miracle or sign of the Lord Jesus, we have a crisis at a wedding. Here, it's a crisis in the home, because this official whose son was ill. And when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, who told him? Who told him, this man, this royal official, that Jesus was at Cana? Somebody told him. I wonder who is going to tell the people around us about Jesus? Whose responsibility is it to tell people? That's why we're meeting tomorrow night. There are hundreds and hundreds of people, thousands, who have no idea today that Jesus is the Savior of the world and their need of a Savior. So, someone told this man about the Lord Jesus that he was at Cana of Galilee. It's interesting that it says that Jesus came from Judea to Galilee. If you go back to chapter 4, it says he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. So the Lord leaves Judea to the beginning and travels to Galilee. But then it says he had to pass through Samaria. And he spent two days in Samaria. What would have happened if the Lord Jesus had spent four days in Samaria? If he had spent four days in Samaria... This man wouldn't have heard that Jesus was in Cana in Galilee. So why is all this happening that Jesus only spent two days in Samaria and comes here to Cana of Galilee? Is this, is that God is behind it all? And that's the same in my life and your life. Why are you in church this morning? Why are you here? You might say, I'm always here. But maybe you're here for the first time today and you're wondering that why, I, why am I here? I heard a really interesting story uh, from Nicky Gumbel, who's retired as a vicar of Holy Trinity Brompton. And in his last Alpha course, he speaks of a, a man that was on it. And this man was an atheist. His mom had died. In his grief for his mom, he just felt he couldn't continue. And he went one day to the grave to see his mom's grave, and to tell his mom that he would shortly be joining her. And as he was walking along the cemetery, lying on the ground was a Barclays Bank Visa card, and he picked it up. And this was a bank card of someone he knew 
from 25 years previously. I hadn't spoken to this person for 25 years. And this person's brother had died and was buried close to this atheist mom. So he contacted the man that he knew from 25 years ago. And this man had become a Christian. And he invited him on to Alpha, and this atheist came on to Alpha, was converted, and Nicky Gumbel finished it by saying, he's about to be baptized. God doesn't make mistakes. You are here this morning because God wants you to be here because there are words that you need to hear. And when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, I love this. He went to him. He did not go to Jerusalem. He did not head for the scribes or Pharisees or doctors of the law. He went to him. This was a distressed dad. We find distressed parents in the Bible. We find a distressed mom, a Canaanite mom, whose daughter was miserably possessed by a demon. What did she do? She went to Jesus. We find a dad who was concerned about his son's be a son being epileptic, who was falling at the fire and water. What did he do? He went to Jesus. What did Jairus do when his daughter was ill? He was a dad whose daughter was very ill. What did he do? He went to Jesus. What did this a royal official do? He went to him. What did we do? What do you do when we feel distress and worry and concern for family or maybe your grandchildren or someone in your family today? What do we do? We go to Jesus. And there are many in this church today, and I know in speaking to you and myself, is that your heart breaks for that loved one who's not yet converted. And you've prayed for many years and or maybe your heart today is unknown to anyone really concerned for something is going on in your family. What do you do? You come to Jesus. It might be your family is having problems at school or bullying or, or just something in family life that is causing you like this man here to be distressed. You know, the hymn says it so well. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Whatever our distress is, we bring it like this man. He went to him and he asked him. And this word asked is the word beg, it's beseech, it's entreat, it's request. It's in the imperfect tense, which means he kept asking. He did not give up. He kept coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, my son is dangerously ill. He's on the point of death. Please, do you feel the, 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 the intensity? I wonder how many of you remember the Greek word that I spoke at the prayer meeting and then took up on the church on the Sunday morning. Somebody very generously today has given me a box of quality streets. If you know this, if you know this word, I will give you something out to the... Um, the box of quality streets. Who can remember that Greek word? Such an important word for us to remember. Well, it just means that I get all the quality streets. <laughs> the word is proskaterio. Proskaterio. Ten times in the Bible, five times in relation to prayer, and it speaks of persevering. And there are some of you today that might have given up, and you've stopped praying for that son or that grandson, and you've prayed into a family situation, and you're feeling, Lord, it's not happening. Proscar Terio, persevere. Is there someone in church today, and you're distressed? I feel the Lord is wanting me to say this today, and you're distressed about a family situation. Is there someone that once prayed passionately for their son or grandson or husband or wife or to be converted or to be healed, and your prayers have fallen silent, and the Lord is saying to you today, 
Keep praying. Keep praying. And this, was, this man, he came and he said, come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. There was every reason, when I was going over this in my mind, there's every reason for this man, the royal official, not to travel. He had to travel a distance. His son was gravely ill, and, 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 and what could Jesus do? And there's always something that will discourage us and make us look at the problem and look at the situation and, or look at it and think, you know, it's too big for the Lord to do. And we lose heart. And when he comes to the Lord Jesus, sometimes what the Lord says in 48 surprises you. So Jesus says to him, unless you see the signs and wonders, you will not believe. I might have expected the, the Bible that says, and Jesus being moved with compassion or, 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 or spoken some words of compassion. But it seems here that the Lord starts by saying, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. It's not that signs and wonders are wrong. We've got them in Acts. And uh, the Lord said in Mark 16 that signs and wonders will follow those that believe. But Campbell Morgan says this. He gave him no sign, but he created an opportunity for the expression of a faith which looked for a sign. Christ said, in effect, I will not give you a sign. I will give you a word. You will get a sign after your faith operates. The Lord Jesus is saying here, he's going to give them, he, what he's trying to draw out here from this man and from everyone there, because when it says, unless you, this is in the plural, he's speaking to a people of unbelief, and he's trying and he's speaking faith. He wants to bring them to faith. And the official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. And even this shows the royal official, his faith is limited. If you think of the centurion that came to Jesus, the centurion said to the, to the Lord Jesus, only speak a word, my servant's in the house, just come and speak a word and he will be healed. This man believes that unless the Lord comes, he cannot heal. And also, we find that he says he's at the point of death. It's as if to say that if he dies, it will be too late. He hasn't the faith of Jairus. When Jairus' daughter died, Jairus said, come and lay hands upon her and she will live. And Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. And this here is a dilemma for the man. What's the man going to do here? The Lord Jesus is saying to him, go, your son will live. But this man is wanting the Lord to come down and heal his son. This man has a decision to make, and we're told the decision he makes. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him. I love that. He believed the word. Jesus promised it. He believed it. He's resting his faith upon what the Lord Jesus has said. So it says he went in his way. And as we watch this man heading back to Capernaum, I want to ask everyone in church a question today. Are you a believer? Are you a believer on the Lord Jesus Christ? You might be like those in Cana of Galilee, because when Jesus says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe, maybe you're like people I meet in a conversation who say, if there was more evidence, if there was more proof, I would believe. Jesus said himself in Luke 16, even if one comes back from the dead, they will not believe. They have Moses and the prophets. They have my word. And maybe you're someone like that today. I want more proof. When the Lord is calling you, and you may say, why do I need to believe? You need to believe because you're a sinner. What do you believe? You believe that Christ died on that cross for your sins, and you come to the cross as a sinner, and you accept to invite the Lord Jesus Christ into your life. I had uh, saw this on Twitter, and I thought, this is really good, these words. This was a, just came up on Twitter. Someone wrote this. I went before the cross and was saved, 6 19, and set free from every simple, simple part. Now I go to church three times a week, once on a Wednesday, two times Sunday. 
and strive to share my testimony with anyone that will listen so that they may find encouragement to be saved as well. That's what that, that man did. That's what the queen did. She had to go before the cross. Even though the queen lived a remarkable life, her works, her life of service, whatever we do, it is the blood of Christ that cleanses us from sin. It is the blood of Christ that removes every sin. It is faith in Christ that sees a man or woman saved. And let me ask you today, are you a believer in Christ? As we get back to the man, I would love to picture today the man walking back to, or however he got back to Capernaum. I picture him as he stops for a cup of coffee. Maybe it's the same place he stopped for coffee and, and the way up. Maybe it's like King, Cass, kings at the castles of the, car, the coffee, but maybe it's a bit like that. He stops for a cup of coffee. And they say to him, you look different. Because they remember him on the way up. He was so distressed. He was so worried. He was in turmoil. They could see it. And he told them that his son was on the point of death and he was heading to Capernaum, to Cana. But they said to them, you look different. What's happened? Oh, he says, my son's been made well. Your son's been made well, but you've not been back home yet. No, I've not been back home yet, but Jesus said it. But they're saying, you've not been home yet. How do you know that your son's been made well? Well, Jesus said it. Your son lives. I believe it. He's been made well. Faith puzzles. Faith leaves people puzzled. Your faith will leave people puzzled. They'll say, how can you? And how can you believe this? And just like this man, faith can leave people wondering. And as he was going down, his servants met him. I just picture him as he was coming to the house. His servants can't wait to get out. They're saying they met him. So the servants are going out to meet him. Do you think they looked at him and thought, why is he so peaceful? Why is he so happy looking? And they told them that his son was recovering, his son was made well. I can just hear him saying, look, I know. I know he's been made well. But he asked the question. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday, the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that this was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. That must have been a remarkable moment when he came into the house. A picture again, my imagination often goes into overdrive in these passages. I imagine his son running out to him and saying, Dad, I've been made well. I just imagine the dad giving him a hug. What do you think the dad felt the moment he hugged his son? Who do you think he thought of? He thought of Jesus. And he goes into the house and it says he himself believed. That's the second time it says the man believed. We have it earlier on. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he himself believed, and all his household. He must have taken his wife, his children, and his servants, this royal official, and shared about the Lord Jesus. And what happened is this, his house believed. You and I have a responsibility, Christians, within our homes as God gives us wisdom in our community and the lives we touch to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. What is the purpose of the signs? We have it in the end of John, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in His name. Part of the reasons for the signs was not simply to cause belief for the first time, but cause believers' faith to be strengthened. We need a strengthening of our faith. We need to lay hold on the Word of God and believe it. This book, I recommend it. It's a really good book, Imprisoned with Isis Faith in the Face of Evil. He wrote a letter, a second letter he wrote to his wife was this, my dear ones, thanks a lot for your letters, but this is the, the, the part that, it, I was so encouraged with. This test is not beyond our strength. This is a man in Sudan for his faith in Christ. And he's writing to his wife back in Czechoslovakia. 
This test is not beyond our strength, and the Lord is faithful and righteous and has prepared an outcome for us. Please be strong in the Lord and trust Him that He is in control. He is the one who has the keys to my cell. Jesus is the one who has the keys to my life and your life, and we trust Him. That's the strengthening of our faith. And finally, one more thing to say about this is this today, is that it's a very familiar passage. Familiar to many you here, you've heard it many times. And quite often if you go a walk and it's a it's a, the familiar walk. You just walk. You've seen it all before. It doesn't register. I was down to see my daughter, Caroline. We were down for a couple of days, and we, she took us up to the Pentland Hills, and it was great seeing things for the first time. Even the sheep looked different. Everything kind of looked. It was like, wow. Oh, look at the hills. Look at this. But when you go a familiar walk, you kind of just take it. You know, you walk through John's gospel today. Some of you have, you've heard this and heard it, and heard it. I want us to leave with this thought. The Lord Jesus is alive. And the Lord Jesus is still the powerful Savior as He was then, as He is today. And we need this belief as we come to our prayer meeting on a Thursday night. We need this belief in our services on a Sunday. We need this belief as we go outside He can do it. Jesus can do it. And as we come across lives, as we come across people that are without Christ, the Lord changed water into wine. He can change the sinner into a saint. Hallelujah. Christ can do it. We need that faith. We need that faith that looks at people in enslavement to drugs or alcohol, the occult, so many things. They're touching lives and seeing this. We must believe today that the Savior of John 4 is the Savior who can come in to circumstances today and change lives. Do we believe this? Yesterday in Edinburgh, I stopped. I like speaking and just stopping to speak to homeless people. What a beautiful girl it was. And in her eyes was sadness. So much sadness in her eyes. I love just sitting hearing their story. How many people today have sad stories? Things that have happened in their life. We have a Savior to tell them of. And today, as our eyes are open to Jesus, faith, we've seen the faith of the royal official and how the story changed for this boy. And finally, just to grasp this today, there's two things I want us to grasp from this passage. One is this, our eyes are open to see the wonderful, transformed person of the Lord Jesus and His power. But secondly is this, the the faith of the royal official. The boy would never have been healed if his dad hadn't had the faith to come to Jesus. I wonder today whose story will change because we are the faith to bring them to Jesus. I wonder today if we have the faith to keep praying for the people that come into our lives to take their names, to take their names before the Lord Jesus. He's alive. And because of our faith, we can change someone's story. And one day, what a day that will be when we hear this, because we took that person to Jesus, your son lives, your daughter lives, your grandson lives, your husband lives, because you're the faith to pray for them. I just want to stop stop for a moment and just for us all just to pause and think about people in our life. Our eyes have been opened again today to the wonderful person of the Lord Jesus. But just stop for a moment and think about people that we know who are not saved.
just again in the quietness of this church, quietly lift them up before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to keep praying for them. Or I'm going to bring them again. I've forgotten about them, but I'm going to bring them before you again. I'm going to be proscatory. I'm just going to keep persevering. Even though the, everything looks bleak, I'm just going to keep praying. And I'm going to keep praying. And I'm going to keep praying.